Eurorack is a really fun and exciting way to make music, but it can be confusing when you're just getting started. If you've been watching demos online, then you've probably seen something like this. Some modules all connected together in some mysterious way, with wires running between them. There's a lot of obvious questions here. What do all these modules do? In just this little sample rack, there's almost 90 individual jacks. What are they all for? Are these wires all the same? Is there some correct way of hooking them up? Or can you hurt anything if you do it wrong? And in the modular community, we just sort of assume that people are going to figure it out. You can come into the modular subreddit and see people asking basic questions all the time, usually being downvoted for it. And if people don't get those questions answered, some may just leave the modular community altogether. So that's why I'm making these videos, to help people who are just getting started to get past that initial uncertainty and confusion. But there's a lot of ground to cover there. You could do a whole class on getting started in Eurorack. For this video, though, I'm not going to go deep into what all the modules do. That's for another time. But instead, I want to start with how the pieces get wired or patched together. And I'm going to look at it in this order. First, I'm going to tell you quickly about the specific cables we use, just in case you haven't seen them. Then I'm going to talk about the four type of signals that move around inside of a patch, how we can modify them, some common concerns that people have. And then I'm going to talk just a bit about why Eurorack audio can be so loud and what we can do about it. If you find these slides and diagrams helpful, they're available for download here. Now, maybe it's a bit obvious, but if you've never touched a Eurorack modular setup, then let me introduce you to the patch cable we're going to use. Other modular formats use different types of patch cables, but for Eurorack, this is what we're talking about. It's a mono cable with a 1 8 inch plug. You can get them in different colors and different lengths. Some have thicker braided cables, others are noodly and thin, but they all function the same. There are a couple cool variations, like stackable or hopscotch cables, that let you send a signal to more than one place. But typically, we're just going to use regular cables, and you may end up with quite a few of them. And you're almost always going to work with mono cables. Even if you're working with stereo sound, there's just going to be two of these instead of a single stereo cable. If you're not sure how to tell the cables apart, it's pretty easy. When you look at the plug on the end, you can see that it's made up of a couple different sections. In a mono cable, there's the tip and the sleeve. You'll sometimes see this called a TS jack, T for tip, S for sleeve. In a stereo cable, there's an extra segment, the ring. You'll see this called a TRS cable. When you do see TRS cables in Eurorack, it's almost always for either outputting stereo sound to some external gear, or it gets used to carry digital MIDI signals. And when I say that all the cables function the same, I'm starting to get at the fundamental truth of patching up a modular synth. It's all just voltage. These cables all just carry electricity around from one place to the other. And it's not a lot of electricity. Typically the voltage ranges will be minus 5 to plus 5 volts. They'll call that bipolar since it goes both positive and negative. Or there'll be a unipolar 0 to 10 volts. Once in a while you'll see something a little crazy that goes from minus 10 volts to plus 10 volts, but that's relatively uncommon. One question that gets asked a lot is if you can hurt modules by sending in more voltage than they expect. And generally speaking, the answer is no. 10 volts really isn't that much, and most of the components inside of a module are able to handle that voltage. Somewhere there's probably some ill-behaved module that outputs outside these ranges, and some other module that doesn't protect itself well enough, and then you might have a bad day. But I can't say I've ever heard of that happening, and certainly not with modern modules that you'd buy retail. But just because it's all a bit of electricity doesn't mean there aren't different ways of using it. I'm going to go into each of these in a moment, but in general, you can think of a signal going between modules as being in one of four different categories. There's audio signals, gates and triggers, pitch control voltage, and modulation control voltage. Every connection between modules is sending one of these types of signals, and most patches are going to use all of them. When I make diagrams for these videos, I color code the lines to make it a bit more clear which is doing what, and we're going to look at one of those diagrams here in a moment. But first, let's take a closer look at each one of those four types of signal. An audio signal is the type that most people are familiar with. These are mostly defined as having changes in voltage hundreds or thousands of times per second. You're going to hear the term audio rate a lot, and that's what it refers to. And these rapid changes can be very regular, like would come out of an oscillator, or they can be all over the place, like of a sample of a voice. There are triggers and gates. Those are just when a voltage starts low, suddenly jumps high, and then goes low again. 
With a trigger, it usually only stays high for a very short period of time, and in a gate it stays open longer. The only difference between a trigger and a gate is how long the voltage stays high for. You can sort of think of it as a trigger tells a module to do something, and a gate tells it to do something for this amount of time. Now we get into control voltage, and it comes in two varieties. There's pitch CV. You may have already heard the term one volt per octave, and that's the standard that pitch CV uses. If you want to make something an octave higher, you add one volt to the pitch CV. If you want to make it a semitone higher, you add one twelfth of a volt. And as a result, you'll see that the CV often goes up and down in stepped increments. That's what quantization is. Finally, there's CV that you use to modulate, or to vary over time, some behavior of a module. If it controls anything other than pitch, it's modulation CV. And when you hear the term CV on its own, that's usually what it means. So let's see them all in action together. Here's a block diagram of a basic full voice patch. You can see how the sequencer is sending pitch information in pink to the oscillator and a gate in brown to the envelope generator. The oscillator then outputs audio in green and that's chewed on by the filter and passed to a VCA. The VCA basically acts as a kind of sound valve that allows audio through based on how much modulation CV, in blue, is being provided by the envelope generator, the ADSR. Don't worry about it if you don't know what these parts do yet, that'll come in the next video. But that's a full voice patch. You're sort of building up these custom circuits that connect together the various components. I sometimes think of it as programming an analog sound computer, but I'm a big old geek. Something that comes up often is, why do different modules produce or accept different voltages? Why aren't there standards? And not to be glib, but there are standards, at least in terms of how much voltage gets used. Minus 5 to plus 5 volts, or 0 to plus 10 volts, are very common. Sometimes people get clever and use something like minus to plus 10 volts, but mostly we can think about minus 5 to plus 5 and 0 to 10. Now concentrating on those first two, we've got a range of 10 volts, either from 0 to 10 or from minus 5 to plus 5. The only real difference is that one of them goes into the negative and the other doesn't, and that's usually for a good reason. A trigger, for instance, has no need to go negative. It doesn't really mean anything. Also for a VCA, the output of a VCA gets louder the more voltage you put into it, so what would a negative CV mean in that situation? On the other hand, audio often sweeps back and forth across positive and negative, and negative modulation can also be used to reduce the value of some setting. And like everything else in modular, there are exceptions, and I guess this is what people are really asking about when they talk about standards. The only answer I can really provide is that most modules, even the ones by big companies, start out with the designer building the module that works the way they want it to. It reflects their own design and patching philosophy. And that's not going to be the same as somebody else's. And I encourage people to think about this as a feature of the system, not a bug. It does require that you need to learn a bit more about each module, but it'll also lead you to using them differently. One very common necessity in a patch is reducing the voltage level coming out of one module and going into another. A range of 10 volts, for instance, if you use it to change pitch, that would span 10 octaves. That's probably not what you're going for. Or maybe you just want a little subtle change to the cutoff of a filter, but that 10 volt sweep just sends it going crazy. And that's why you're almost immediately going to run into the term attenuator. That's just a big word that means to reduce the intensity of a signal. Many modules have attenuators, or attenuverters, where they can invert the signal as well, but they're built right into many inputs, so you can turn it right down there where you need it. But just as many don't do that, and you'll have to handle it yourself. Building on that, another common problem is that maybe you've got a modulator that sends out minus 5 volts to plus 5 volts, but what you need is only positive and less intense than that. Like this signal here. We really want to attenuate it to reduce the amplitude of the signal, and then offset it upwards to get it out of negative territory. There are dedicated modules to do this scaling and offsetting, but something like maths can do it for you as well. This is a pretty common occurrence, and you'll probably find yourself trying to solve this problem after not too long. So now you might be wondering, what if I plug one type of signal into a jack that expects something else? Can I break anything? And no, in fact, this is kind of a feature of modular synths. You can plug anything into anything, and you might get really interesting results from it. 
Indeed, it's pretty common for these different types of signal to act like something different. You can use an audio signal as CV to modulate a filter. Or if you open and close a gate fast enough, it becomes a pulse wave oscillator. Filters usually work on audio signals, but some of them can be pinged or fed a quick trigger to make itself oscillate a bit. Don't be afraid to mix and match and explore. That's the best way to learn. Another question is, what if I plug an input into another input by accident? And again, the answer is that you're really unlikely to hurt anything. Most modules have one of these little guys, a diode, in front of the inputs and outputs, and they keep electricity from going the wrong way. Some modules even encourage you to try plugging things in that way and have interesting behavior when you do it. If you're using a bunch of handmade gear, well, it's possible that maybe they didn't put in this protection, but anything that you buy from a manufacturer is going to be fine. Although I said earlier that you can't really hurt anything with this low voltage, there is one caveat that needs to be understood. You may have heard someone referring to Eurorack audio as being hot or loud, and that's why you need specialized modules to get sound into or out of your rack. This all comes back to Eurorack voltage standards being in the 5 to 10 volt range. Normal line level consumer audio equipment runs at more like 1 volt, so a module that outputs audio at 10 volts is going to be several times louder than normal gear. Many mixers can handle this hot of a signal, so you probably won't hurt anything. And it isn't that hard to reduce the voltage. You can just use one of those attenuators I mentioned, and that will reduce the voltage and therefore the loudness of the signal. You might get better audio using a VCA or a dedicated output module, but especially when you're getting started, there's no problem with doing it this way. Going the other direction though, you do need to amplify the external signal quite a bit to get it up to Eurorack standards. And that's not quite as easy, and it is best to go with a dedicated input or preamp module to do that for you. And there you have it. I hope at this point you can see why patching a modular synth is really just about moving around different types of voltage, and that the different types are somewhat interchangeable. Also, it's pretty unlikely that you can hurt anything with normal usage, so don't worry about experimenting. That's kind of the whole idea. Next time we'll talk more about some of the common types of modules that you'll run into, and how they create and operate on these types of signals. So if you made it this far, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it. Thanks for watching.